So um, today I wanted to give just a brief overview of this sort of meta model that Ken Wilber often presents when he's talking about states of consciousness. And going back to uh, Ryan's presentation last week, um, he gave a quick overview, which is hard to do, frankly, of integral theory and the all quadrants, all levels, all lines, all states, all types kind of orientation. And today I kind of wanted to zoom into the states part of that and look at what does it mean to say all states and uh, why are states important when it comes to waking up? And in a way, I think um, waking up is all about state work. It's all about kind of um, beginning to untangle who and what we take ourselves to be um, in terms of what is passing through our conscious experience. What, what do we identify with? Who are we? Um, are we this thought? Are we these body sensations? Are we these mental states, these patterns of body and mind? Um, are we these subtle, subtle, formless, open, expansive states of consciousness that can be discovered in deep sleep or in deep meditation experience? Uh, or are we none of those things? Are we just the uh, rising and passing of phenomena and the open space in which it's occurring? Um, well, uh, with this model, uh, th this gross, subtle, causal, non-dual model, um, uh, I'm going to kind of uh, cover something that I think it's kind of includes all of those things in some ways. And one thing I'd like to mention is this map I found really helpful for kind of understanding all of the different kinds of maps of consciousness. Um, you know, the different kinds of maps that you find in different contemplative traditions um, that talk about different states of consciousness. Now, all these different traditions, they have very different starting points in terms of their metaphysics, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism have a, have a shared root in the Indic yogic tradition. So there's a lot of overlap there in the monotheistic traditions, Christianity and Judaism and Islam, they all have kind of similar things, but even within these sort of similar religious traditions and contemplative traditions, not to mention the secular rational postmodern traditions that have popped up the new religious movements. Um, you know, they they talk about things in very different ways. Um, so this map is not meant to be sort of a specific practice-oriented map. It's not meant to help you kind of navigate through a particular approach. It's meant to be more like a kind of broad meta map of the different maps of contemplative experience. And that's what I found it primarily useful for is like an orienting model. And in this model, as you see with the sort of concentric circles here, uh, we're going to be looking at three different um, kind of spheres or realms of experience. And then we're going to be looking at the background or the, you could say, the, um, the paper um, upon which this whole model rests. And in the first um, layer here, the first circle at the center, we're looking at what, what could be called the gross realm or, the, or gross experience. Not gross in the sense of like, ugh, I don't like that, but gross in the sense of heavy, obvious, dense, um, meaning our gross physical experience. And this gross realm, uh, as Ken describes it, it really corresponds with our waking experience, our normal waking experience. We're walking around, having this body, these normal thoughts. Um, uh, it, it really isn't describing what typically happens in deeper meditation experience uh, or when we're dreaming, which is the next realm, the next circle, the subtle realm or subtle experience. Um, this is really corresponds with dreaming. Um, and it corresponds also with, I think, a lot of meditative experiences or psycho psychedelic experiences. Uh, experiences where our normal sense of waking consciousness and waking identity and our waking body uh, begins to become much more fluid, um, begins to dissolve, uh, begins to kind of open up. Um, and if you think about, you know, what it's like when you're dreaming, uh, and what it's like to have a body in the dream world, a dream body, um, it changes, right? It's not always the same. It's not always this waking body that you have. Like sometimes it might look like that, but sometimes you might look down and you're like, you know, a giraffe or something, um, or you're just some amorphous kind of blob. But what's interesting is we still do have a sense of a body and a sense of identity, even in this much more fluid, open, amorphous, subtle space. So 
it's, it's accurate, I think, to talk about this being a realm of experience and a body, uh, a subtle body through which we're experiencing it. Uh, and the subtle, subtle experience can include all kinds of things like experiences of illumination, of bliss, um, of uh, ecstasy, of uh, often really I think light is associated most often when I think about the subtle realm, there's a sense of, uh, of perceiving uh, form that's much more uh, light and vibratory and uh, not as dense. Um, and that covers a big wide range of possible experiences. Uh, as we begin to venture further out in this model, as things get even more subtle, even more difficult to discern, um, then we get out into what we could call the causal realm or causal experience, or sometimes it's called the very subtle experience. Um, when I think of this, I often go back to my own training in the insight meditation Theravada tradition where one of the core practices is a concentration-based practice in which you learn how to access these different states of consciousness. There are eight of them called the eight jhanas, or meditative absorptions. Mm -hmm. And as you work through these eight jhanas with each one, they become progressively more formless. In fact, the first four jhanas are called the form jhanas, and the second four are called the formless jhanas. And so you see a very similar progression as this model describes in which one starts first with becoming absorbed in physical bliss and pleasure. Uh, and then there's a kind of progressive dropping off of things as you move forward. So it's not gaining something new. It's actually letting go of things that are more obvious and finding uh, new levels and layers of subtlety to become absorbed in. And as you get into the formless jhanas, the, what they're called the arupa jhanas, the, without form, um, then you have descriptions of, thing, of states like infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness. And the last one is neither perception nor yet non-perception. So think about as how subtle is neither perception nor non-perception. That's about as subtle as you can get. That's on the far edges of this, of this map. And, and I like those names because they describe to me what the experience is actually like. Um, that there's a sense of feeling yourself as infinite and boundless space or consciousness or even nothingness. And it's strange because for some people, the idea of experiencing nothing sounds like there wouldn't be anything there. But in this causal realm of experience, we actually become... Um, attuned enough to the subtlety of experience that we can actually perceive nothing. And there is a sense of awareness or a perceiver, even though it's quite subtle, that is aware of nothing. So nothing is something, actually. Um, but it's not the something that we're used to. Um, and so in the causal realm, we're really dealing with um, these kind of formless experiences. And this corresponds uh, in the tradition, the yogic traditions, with what's called deep sleep. Um, this experience of being not in a dream state, but in the sort of spaces in between dreaming, in between the REM cycles, um, in which most of us don't remember or recall anything at all. It's like there was nothing. Oh, wait, didn't we just talk about nothing? <laughs> sometimes we're aware of nothing and sometimes we're not aware of nothing. We just kind of lose ourselves in nothing. In fact, in many of the Buddhist monasteries in Southeast Asia, they say sleep is poor man's nirvana. Um, that is, it, this is a, a way that we can experience uh, this, what, it, what in the early Buddhist tradition is described as a cessation or a complete uh, blowing out of experience and of an observer and awareness to, to notice that experience, complete uh, dropping away of body-mind. Um, that to me is like the most formless or causal experience that I'm, that I'm personally aware of. Sometimes it's called nirvikapa samadhi, being totally absorbed in, in nirvana and cessation and no, no, no exper experience whatsoever and no one to be aware of that, no experience. And um, this 
in some ways really brings us to the edge of this map. Uh, it brings us to the very outside perimeter of the last circle. And what's beyond that? Well, it's interesting because there, in a way there is nothing beyond that. And, and because there's nothing beyond that, there's nowhere else we can get to because that's not even an experience. Then what can happen is we end up waking up to what we could call the non-dual in which we discover our own deepest identity includes that formless, empty, primordial awareness that is no thing whatsoever. It's no experience itself. It's not a state that's coming and going. It doesn't exist in any of these real categories. It's not even a formless experience of infinite consciousness or infinite space. Even that is a subtle sense of self or identity there. This is the dropping away of identity. And when we realize that that is part of our nature, or that is our, you could say that's our fundamental nature, then usually people, when people realize that, they don't just die. <laughs> Although in some traditions, they think that, that actually can happen, <laughs> that you kind of wake up and then you're dead. But, but, but here, when someone awake, awakens to this, they actually continue living, even though they, their sense of identity transforms um, there is a sense in which experience continues. Gross experience continues. The waking body continues. The subtle experience continues. You can still dream. And formless experience continues. You can still go into deep sleep or into these formless states. So this realization of nirvana doesn't preclude any of these other states from arising. It, doesn't, it, it is not its state itself, so it's not incompatible with any state. In fact, the non-dual recognition is that all states have this as their fundamental uh, nature, um, that this emptiness is the nature of form, of, of all states, um, that all states are interdependently arising and that they are all empty. I'll put another way from the second turning perspective. And within that non-dual awareness, there is this kind of freedom, freedom of nirvana, and there is a fullness of experience, fullness of whatever's arising. And because we're free from identification in that state, uh, the stateless state, then there's a, a deeper sense of allowing everything to arise, that it can just be what it is. The ego can contract and be held in big mind. And that's okay. Um, we can be angry and upset and confused confused and that actually is okay that's not a problem from from the non-dual perspective we can be in deep state of ecstasy and bliss and okay that's just another state from the perspective of the non-dual it's not necessarily better uh, than some other state again from that perspective it's it's more subtle um, for sure it's more pleasant definitely um, to some part of us, it's more preferable, absolutely. <laughs> but to this deeper part of us, uh, or this, this part of us that is um, complete uh, right now, um, then all states appear in the same way. They have, as the Tibetans say, one taste. And this is an acquired taste. In the same way that you acquire the taste for things like wine or for coffee, you know, things that initially kind of taste weird. For me, it was sparkling water. I didn't really like it, and I had to keep drinking it. And then one day I was like, oh, wait, I get this. This is great. Uh, and you acquire the taste in the same way for non-duality. Um, here's a quote I really like that describes this sort of the, the non-duality as a union of, uh, of these states. This is from Rangjung Dorje, the third Karmapa, in his aspirational prayer for Mahamudra which is a, um, a non-dual practice tradition in Tibet. And he says, it doesn't exist. Even the victorious ones haven't seen it. Meaning nirvana doesn't exist. This non-dual experience doesn't exist. There's, there's something that even the Buddhas haven't seen because it's not a state. And yet it's not non-existent because it's the basis of all samsara and nirvana. There's the non-dual basis of all things. This is not a contradiction because this is the unity of the middle way. May we realize the true nature of mind, which is free from all limitations and all extremes. 
I think that's a beautiful pointer um, and wanted to share that with you. Um, Because for me, it it, it helps me remember uh, this truth. And then the part that I kind of wanted to add, because in this model, um, I've just described each of the sort of uh, layers of experience, of state experience, and this sort of always already background, the non-dual. And what's interesting is that when we are practicing a contemplative tradition within a tradition or we're using some kind of meditative practice, we're working with our attention in some intentional way, we begin to very quickly start to experience these things for ourselves. And many of you I know have extensive experience with these states of consciousness. And what's interesting, what I've noticed is there seem to be two basic paths pathways that one can move through these states, moving from gross to subtle to causal in particular. And we'll talk about the non-dual because it's a special category. And one of them I would call the path of freedom and the other I'd call the path of fullness. So I want to say just a little bit about that. And this first graphic is really an attempt to illustrate what the path of freedom looks like. So the little black dot there that's sitting right now in the causal somewhere, that is us, that is ourselves. And the arrow is describing the movement that, that, uh, that we are taking, which is a kind of backward movement. We're actually moving from the gross backward through the subtle and into the causal. Um, and this is a way of describing the path of freedom or any kind of path of practice which emphasizes what could be called the path of negation, of recognizing your experience, say your gross waking experience, and going, wait, I see that there's a bodily sensation, I see a thought, I see this belief arising, there's thinking, there's touching, there's wondering, and we begin to be able to recognize that experience. And through recognizing it, we are no longer identified with it. So we are on the path of negation of saying, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this. Everything that arises, we can actually observe it. We can notice any state which is occurring if we are tr- our attention is trained sufficiently. And so in this path, we begin to gradually push our sense of subject, our self sense back. And we make what was previously felt like us, our identity, we see that actually it was made up of experiences. And we start to see, oh, that's not who I am. So this is the process of awakening, of transforming our sense of self, our sense of the world, our sense of what's going on. And this is one of the ways that the path can unfold for people. I remember uh, when I was at Naropa University, and taking a contemplative Hinduism class with this teacher named Sri Devi Ringi. And she was talking about how in India, in the Hindu tradition, there are a number of different major schools. One of them is called Vedanta, the Vedanta school. And another is called the Tantric school, Tantra. And you have this also in the Buddhist tradition. And um, what she said about it, and which is the first thing that, this was the first time I really got clued into these different ways of moving through these great states. She said in the Vedanta school, the basic approach is not this, not this, not this, not this. Just like with uh, the early Buddhist path of Vipassana, not this, not this. Observe it. If you can observe it, you're not it. Um, And then she said with Tantra, though, they take the exact opposite approach. They say this too, this too, this too. This too, anything that feels like is not you, you can actually embrace it. You can fold it into your sense of self. You can actually see that that yourself with a capital S includes everything. With the, where the other path is really focused on seeing that everything that you can experience is not yourself. So it sounds like they're completely opposite. But to me, they're actually just different ways of moving through the path. So the path of fullness would look like this. Here we are, the circle, and we're moving out and we're growing and we're expanding to include 
our gross experience, to include more subtle experience. Anytime we, we reach a, an experience that seems to be new or outside of us or something we've never seen before, we don't assume that it's not who we are. We actually assume that it's something we just hadn't recognized as, as our deepest self, uh, as, as part of the oneness of life and the universe and God. And we embrace it. We become one with it. We include it in our, in our, in our total embrace. So this would be the path of fullness. This too, this too, this too, this too. And uh, at the same time that I was studying contemplative Hinduism, I ran across the contemplative uh, Christianity um, uh, paths. And I took a, a beautiful class at Nirvana on that as well. And while I didn't kind of have a deep experience myself of that tradition, I had enough of a sense from hearing about the history of contemplative Christianity to realize that they were describing something just like this too. And they talked about this in terms of the path of via negativa and via positiva. They also had two different kind of categories of prayer, um, apophatic prayer on the one hand, which is a kind of formless prayer, a prayer without form, and then cataphatic prayer, which is a prayer with form, like Lectio Divina would be an example of cataphatic prayer where there's words and there's a form to it and there could be light and experiences and things happening. Whereas apophatic prayer, um, which, which I understood really uh, what Father Thomas Keating was teaching in Centering Prayer as a kind of apophatic prayer, um, that there could be this kind of experience of deep uh, relinquishment of form and, and letting go into an experience of, of the formlessness of God. And uh, it was just so interesting to see that, like, across these different contemplative traditions, they, they, they each seemed to be describing things that were similar in terms of a, of a pathway or a movement through these states. So that's one thing I'd like to just kind of add to this model is that you know, we can take this path of freedom of negation, or we can take a path of fullness of inclusion. And both actually end up into, in the same non-dual realization supposing that they continue <laughs> to, to develop. And also, and this is the sort of weird thing, with the non-dual, this is a special category because if this really is the, the paper upon which all these states are drawn, if it's not a state itself, then that means we don't have to do anything particular to get there. We don't have to actually go through all of these states and get to the causal before we can get to the non-dual. That's why I put it on the bottom of this uh, Thing. So it's not at the top, it doesn't look like it's a higher state. It's actually the ground of all states. And so we can actually recognize the ground at any time. And actually no time um, is the best time <laughs> to notice the ground. Um, but what's kind of paradoxical here is that while that is true, and while people do wake up to the ground of their own being, uh, and it doesn't require anything from us to do that, it's also true that we tend to miss the ground. We tend to not see what's doing the looking because we are so caught up in different states of experience of consciousness. And so by training in letting go of the states or by training in expanding our sense of self to include more states, uh, by, by training in states, it can paradoxically lead us to become uh, less attached to states, to have more of a likelihood of uh, awakening to the ground. And, and I think this is what Baker Roshi meant when he said that uh, enlightenment is an accident. Waking up to the non-dual dimension of ground is an accident. It's not something you can make happen. But he also said, and yet meditation makes us more accident prone. Um, it's something that actually can help create the conditions for us to notice the unconditioned. 